if I heard that right, I'm not sure what uh, Brian is insinuating when he said that they weren't going to run you off this morning because you weren't preaching, but are they maybe going to run me off because I'm preaching this morning? Is that what you're saying, Brian? Just a couple things before we get started uh, this morning. Uh, just wanted to remind you, number one, and I want to say a big thanks as well to those who have given peanut butter um, or canned chicken for the community sharing. The basket out in the lobby overfloweth. And so today is like the official end of it, but if you didn't bring it today, that's all right. We always know where to get it. And I assume, Jessica, will you be picking that up this week, taking it with you today, or? Perfect, great. So if you still want to uh, give something and make sure that that uh, gets to community sharing, then please go ahead and bring that. Like I said, we'll make sure to get it where it needs to go. I also want to say a huge thanks as well, too, for those who have uh, been able to uh, contribute to the HVAC fund. Remember, we've got a couple ACs out. We'll talk a little bit more about that today during the family meeting, but uh, we have received some generous donations, generous gifts from uh, several people, um, and so uh, we are very happy about that and very excited about that, and just wanted to say thank you to that as well. You know, I was listening to the worship, and sometimes do you ever find that when you worship, you just are kind of like singing, and then all of a sudden, like, God will hit you. Like, you start to hear the words, like, actually pay attention to them, and you're watching people, and you're like, man, they're just really into worship. And it was that last song, Sweetly Broken, and there are two phrases there at the end of that that are, they seem like they don't really go together, uh, but they go together perfectly, and it says, Sweetly Broken holy surrendered. And I think there's no better mantra, there's no better idea for us than that. You know, sometimes when you have a week or you have a stretch of days where you're just like, oh, I'm just flat up against it, God. And he just, he just gives you sweet mercies and grace in songs and people's words uh, that just kind of encourage you and lift you up. And that, those, those two phrases this morning, sweetly broken, and we need to be wholly surrendered to God, I think is a great reminder to us of what God wants out of us. Like I said this morning, if you have your Bibles, and turn to Acts chapter 13. That's where we'll be this morning. Um, read here in just a minute the first few verses of Acts 13. And what I believe and what many call a, a turning point, uh, and there are many in the book of Acts, a turning point in the book of Acts. And you'll see why, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute, but we've again this month been talking about and looking at what it means to and how we fulfill God's mission that he has given to us, not just individually as Christians, but collectively as the church. And it's a high calling. It's a high, heavy task that we have to go into this world and to make disciples and to bring people to the feet of Jesus Christ, uh, but it's what he is given to us. And I want to start this morning by talking uh, about of all things, because this connects really well with being sent and a mission. I want to talk about art this morning. How many of you people um, really love to admire art? Anybody? And then how many of you are like, I could give two rips about that piece of art on that wall? That's fine. We're fine. See, everybody's good. The kingdom is big enough for everybody. I took an art appreciation class in college, and I'm not really sure why I had to do that or why I chose to do it, but do you know what, and this is just me, that was probably one of the classes that I enjoyed the most. Um, I really got into that class and really soaked in that class, um, and just learning about art and the different techniques and artists and how they do things and all, all this stuff, I was just like kind of geek out on it, and so I still hold some of that stuff today uh, from that class in college. But did you know, and I'm sure that many of you do, even if you do not like art, that most, some, most of the notable pieces of art worldwide throughout all of history have been what they call commissioned art. Now, we understand what commissioned art is, right? They have been specifically requested by someone and financed by someone, an organization, a governing body, uh, a religious figure. Anybody want to tell me and... and, and just wow me with your genius, some famous works of art that were commissioned pieces of art. Sistine Chapel, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. That's one of the ones that I have in this example this morning. That was a commissioned piece of art. You better believe it was. I mean, who in the world gets up on a ceiling and paints that thing, all right, just for the fun of it? 
Any, any other works of art that you can think of that are famous and commissioned pieces of art? You can just throw something out there, even if it doesn't. And, and it might be. I don't know. There's my examples this morning. Yes. Do what? Uh, David, I don't think probably was. I'd have to look and research, but I don't think it was a commission piece. Two of the most famous works of art, guys, and you know them. You just didn't say them. You've seen them. How about Da Vinci's Mona Lisa? The Mona Lisa was a commissioned work of art. The, somebody said it already, Diane said it, the painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel are the best examples of commissioned works of art. As the story goes with the Mona Lisa, the now iconic picture is thought to be a commissioned piece depicting an Italian noblewoman named Lisa Gia Condo. Another of da Vinci's works in his most recognizable paintings, The Last Supper, was also a commissioned work of art. It was done at the request of the Duke, I, I just love to say this because it's Italian and I sound like, you know, really smart. The Duke of Milan, Ludovico Sforza, as part of the renovations to the convent of Santa Maria delle Grazie in Milan. Doesn't, I, I, I don't know a lick of Italian, but didn't that sound really good, like I knew what I was talking about? Michelangelo's breathtaking work on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel was done at the request and backed by, financially by Pope Julius II and the Roman Catholic Church. And a little closer to home, I'm surprised that you guys didn't know this one. Again, if you don't like art, you wouldn't know. Andy Warhol made a career doing commissioned works of arts for celebrities and for entertainers. Uh, honestly, it financed his career, it financed a lot of his projects. He sometimes and most of the times charged anywhere from $25,000 to $40,000 for one piece of commissioned work for a celebrity. I'm like, boy, I, I think I should probably, there's one of his most famous commissioned works of art. I should get into that, right? But guys, I, I think, and the reason I'm talking about commissioned pieces of art and works of art is that I think in many ways, this is what's behind the idea of our text for this morning. I was reading on a website this week, and I told you, I just kind of geek out on this stuff. I was reading on a website about commissioned art and was really diving deep into it. I came across these lines about this concept and the process of commissioning. I just want you to listen to this. While it may intrigue and captivate you, a piece of art that you purchase from a gallery may not have all the creative elements that you desire. If you are in search for a work that truly represents your passion, and your taste, and your style, I love this last line, the best way to obtain one is to commission an artist to create a custom piece for you. And again, I think in Acts chapter 13, what God does is he says, you know what, I've got an idea, I've got a mission, I've got a passion, this is what we're going to do, and he makes it happen in a literal commissioning in this story for this morning. Not in the way that I've been talking about with art this morning, but in a much more meaningful and impactful commissioning, one that involves being sent. And that is our word for today, what we want to talk about, this concept of being sent or being a sending church. And so Acts chapter 13, I just want to read the first five verses, by the way, just as a bonus. It, I want you to go home after we read this story, and I want you to read the rest of what happens uh, through verse 12. Some crazy stuff happens on this first missionary journey as they set out and being sent. But let's start at verse 1. Acts chapter 13. Among the prophets and among the teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria, so they've got some pretty heavy hitter, hitters here, all right? Prophets and teachers. Prophets for the fact that the New Testament, we understand, wasn't written at that time, and so they needed people in churches to be able to interpret the Word of God and to give that Word of God to the people in that church. And these were the prophets and teachers, by the language and by the original language, it's understood that the first three guys that are named are the prophets, and the last two guys are the teachers. But here they were, Barnabas, Simeon called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Menaean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. I love how it does that, right? It gives all these people, and that, by the way, Saul is who we know as Paul, and it just says, and Saul. 
Here's the crazy thing. We'll talk about this a little bit later, too. At this point in the church's life, although we look back all these years later and we're like, Paul, I mean, like the apostle Paul is the man. He was just beginning his ministry. He was like a fledgling kind of like nobody, all right? We, we talked about Paul being converted on the road to Damascus a few weeks ago, but in that time, he's kind of just been hanging out and getting himself ready for ministry, and it really happens here uh, in, in part in, in Acts chapter 13. And so there's Saul, and then it says in verse 2, one day... As these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. And so after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. And so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There in the town of, that's not Salamis, all right, don't read it as that, all right, Salamis. They went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Now, if you were to look at those five verses, you're like, that's great. I mean, we get some really good names there. I mean, we know we've, you're introduced to Barnabas earlier in the book of Acts. Saul, who will just in this chapter kind of transition to Paul, by the way, this is again just bonus information. Saul was his given name, his given Hebrew name, all right? That's what his mom and dad would have called him when they called him for dinner. Saul, Saul, come here. But he lived in what kind of a culture? It was a what culture at this time? A what? A Roman culture. So all the Roman boys and girls that he would play with would call him Paul. That was his Roman name, all right? But we transition even here in Acts chapter 13 to him no longer being called Saul, really. He's Paul. And why would that be significant, by the way, that he starts to go by his Roman name? Because he is the apostle to what? The Gentiles, to Rome, to, to, the, to the world. And so he starts to identify as that. And again, these five verses here that you're like, okay, that's, that's wonderful. We get a lot of names and they start to go on this really cool magical trip. Guys, I don't think it's any stretch to say that we have here in just these first few verses the most important commissionings in all of history, in the church's history, in these few verses here in Acts 13. It may not look as grand and wonderful as the Sistine Chapel, may not be as iconic as the Mona Lisa or the Last Supper, but what is going on here in Acts 13, if we really look at it, and we will this morning, is groundbreaking and it is foundational. Now we understand this as we look at the whole landscape of the book of Acts, and we've been in Acts the last four weeks, but we've really just been kind of at the beginning of things. The whole book of Acts is really a book about being sent. The Spirit is sent to the church and in turn, the church is what? Sent into the world. In the opening chapter of the book, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus returned, he's getting ready to return to heaven, and he says to his disciples what? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Not you may be, or kind of going to be, or if you choose to, you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. Specifically, he mentions four different regions, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we've talked the past few weeks about guys like Paul and Timothy and their travels together, the discipling relationship. Talked last week, Brian preached a sermon on Paul in Athens on Mars Hill last week. But do you understand that neither one of those moments are possible without Acts chapter 13? None of that happens. It's like one of those moments like, what if it never happened? Everything would be different, not only just for the book of Acts, but for the rest of the New Testament and the modern day that we find ourselves in. Paul and Timothy and Barnabas and Silas would have never been where they were and done what they had done without being sent. And that happens here very, very specifically in Acts chapter 13. You know, a term has been coined to describe moments in time within human history that have had a disproportionate influence on the rest of history in the future. They're known as hinge points. So for instance, 
for us in U.S. history, what would be some hinge points in our history? Can you think of any? Say it loud. All right, that's a hinge point. 1492, what else? All right, Concord of Lexington, what else? Revolutionary War, I mean, we've got Civil War, we've got a World War One and Two. Emancipation Proclamation, what more recently would be a hinge point? There you go, 9-11. These are all hinge points, specifically in U.S. history, and they exist all the way out through world history. I mean, we had time, you could go through all kinds of things. Those are some really great ones. But this moment in Acts chapter 13, I'm convinced, not just simply for the Bible or for salvation history, but happening. Again, tra chapter 13 marks a very sharp turn in the book of Acts. I already mentioned this. The first 12 chapters in the book of Acts have recorded events concerning the spread of Christianity simply within Jerusalem. You realize that for most of the book of Acts, right at the very beginning of it, everything is localized and held in Jerusalem. Everything that you read about is happening simply in the city of Jerusalem. Judea and then eventually Samaria up to this point, Jerusalem has been the center of everything in ministry. Peter has been the main guy. He's been the apostle that gets all the fanfare. He's in the spotlight. And now we see everything begin to shift in Acts 13 all the way to the end of the book. Antioch becomes the new center of everything. And guys like Barnabas and Saul, who we later know as Paul, become the new leaders of this fledgling and this new church. Where, where does this come from? Where does this church come from? Where do these people come from, out of, seemingly out of nowhere? How do guys like Barnabas and Saul, and I think it's very significant. Again, I don't want you to miss this. At this point, we always are like, yeah, Paul and Barnabas went on a trip. It, it wasn't that way at first. It was Barnabas and Saul. Can you think of that, by the way? The guy that we know is one of the greatest New Testament leaders of all of the church was at one point and Saul. I think it's actually a really great grace to us. It's a really great comfort to us. Because I don't know about you, but here's how often I think of myself in my life. And Ryan. Don't we all feel like that most of the time in our lives at certain points? We're just the and. We're the add-on, all right? But God has great things, and he can take a guy like Ann Saul and make him Paul, all right? Where do these guys come from? The answer to that is, if you grab your Bibles and you turn back what for me would be just one page to Acts chapter 11, we get the story of the beginning of this church in Antioch of Syria. And here's what it says, starting in verse 19. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution, we'll talk about that a little bit later, that starts and happens back in Acts chapter 8. After this persecution and Stephen's death, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and there's that, there's that church that we're talking about this morning, Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Do you see how things are just starting to switch and turn ever so slightly here in these chapters? It's all about the Jews. It's all about Jerusalem. It's all about telling them the news of the gospel. And now here in this church, this very, very special, unique church, the gospel begins to go to the Gentiles. Now, when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas, they sent Barnabas, not Saul, not, not Paul, not Peter, not James, not John, Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged, because that's what Barnabas did. He was a son of encouragement, encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. And then listen to what happens. Verse 25, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. 
This is the starting point of what happens and what continues in Acts chapter 13. In chapter 13, very significantly, what we meet is the beginning of the last phase of Christ's call to his disciples, to go to the ends of the earth with the gospel. And it is also significantly, like I said, the beginning of the apostleship of Paul. Up to this time, though he was called to be an apostle, when he was first converted on that road to Damascus, he never acted as an apostle. Now, it's probably by the time that we get to Acts chapter 13, although we've only gone just a few chapters from Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, it's probably actually about 11 or 12 years after his conversion, he begins to fulfill the ministry to which he was called as an apostle of Jesus Christ. You remember what God says to him, right? Actually, he says it to Ananias. Colin preached this a few weeks ago, and he says, Ananias, I want you to go to Saul, and I want you to tell him that I have a work for him. He is to be and go to the Gentiles, and I will show him how much he has to suffer for my name. And this whole commissioning, this whole change and shift in what's happening in God's story happens in the most inconspicuous of ways. You have to admit, again, as I read those five verses, you were probably like, that's it? That's like, that's all you're going to preach on this morning? Believe me, there's plenty in these five verses for me to preach on this morning. It starts in the most inconspicuous of ways, but it ends with the first missionary journey involving, this is very, really, and truly here in Acts 13, the very first, as we know it, as we've been given in the Bible, the first foreign missionaries. Now, I know that some people will say, you know, well, there was, there was you know, there was Philip, and he went to Samaria, and there was Peter, and he was talking to Cornelius. Those weren't really, those were what some commentators call accidental missionaries, all right? But this is intentionally sending people out of a church and going into the uttermost parts of the earth. And I just want you for a moment before we step over all these five names and these guys here, don't do that. Catch the guys who were featured in this first church in Antioch of Syria. Barnabas, again, we're introduced to Barnabas earlier in the book of Acts. His name literally means son of encouragement. Anytime that you see the word bar in front of somebody's name, it means son of something. He is the son of encouragement. Barnabas was a man who was born on the island of Cyprus, by the way. Barnabas is from there. Why else would they go to Cyprus? Because it says a lot of the believers in the church in Antioch, Assyria, come from Cyprus. Brian, it's almost like you preached this last week, wasn't it, right, buddy? Do we go where we know? We go to the people that we know. They have contacts. They have connections in Cyprus, and so that's why they go there. He was born on Cyprus, but at this point of his life, he was living in Jerusalem. He had been raised all of his life as a Levite. We know that's a priestly order and a priestly family in the nation of Israel. Israel. And then there was a man by the name of Simeon, or sometimes known as Simon. He was known, it says in my translation here, called the black man, or sometimes in other translations known as Niger, possibly and probably because of his dark colored skin. It's likely that he was from northern Africa, possibly even Cyrene, just like the next guy on the list that we'll talk about here in a minute, Lucius. Now, this is very interesting. I heard this way too much this week in studying for this and watching sermons to just bypass this. I do not know with any certainty. It's just kind of an interesting, hmm, maybe. Many people speculate that this man here, Simon, is the very same man that's mentioned in Matthew 27. You remember what happens there, don't you? The man's name is Simon of what? Cyrene, and he does what? He carries Jesus' cross, the last leg of the cross, to Calvary. Many people, many commentators, many very smart people believe potentially there's a connection here, and this guy is that Simon of Cyrene. Again, I've already mentioned Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was a city in North Africa. And then there is this guy, and I don't want you to miss this at all, because many of the times when we get to the parentheses in the Bible, we just kind of read past it. We're like, because, right, the parentheses in life are not important, but they really are. Pay attention. There's this cat here named Menaean. What does it say about Menaean? He is what? 
It says in my translation, a childhood companion of who? King Herod Antipas. You know who King Herod Antipas is, isn't he? It, it, who is he? What, what, what's he significant for? Who did he send to his death, specifically to his beheading? John the Baptist. That is King Herod Antipas. The very same guy as well, too, who in some respect also sent Jesus to his death. He was part of that whole mock trial. What's very interesting about this is that the original Greek word that's used here for a childhood companion is actually the idea and the language of a foster brother to Herod. He was in some way brought into the family, into the palace, and he grew up right next to Herod Antipas. Isn't this crazy, by the way? How in the world can two guys go in such wildly divergent ways in their life? One who kills prophets and sends the very son of God to his death, and another who becomes a very prominent and important leader in the early church of Antioch of Syria. Guys, the point being here is we don't just skip over this because this was a very multicultural and a very diverse group of guys coming from all walks of life. Honestly, as I look at them, aside from maybe the disciples, but I think even these guys in this church in Antioch are a shade beyond, you could not find a more different group of guys and individuals. Like if you put these five guys together in a room, you're like, watch what happens because they are not going to get along. But they did. They had such unity. They had such togetherness in this church. What they did in their service to God and their sentness from God still reverberates through the halls of history even to today as I sit here and I preach this story again. I just want to make a few observations about these opening verses of chapter 13 that I just read and we've been talking through here. And I want to connect that with what I think God may be saying to us and what he wants us to see and hear this morning. Again, after recognizing this is a very different group of guys, this is a very cosmopolitan group in church, here's what immediately catches my eye, what gets in my ears, and it says this. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. Did you catch that? Now, it wasn't like fireworks were going off there, like, whoa, they were doing some amazing things. What does it say? While these men were using their gifts, while they were, it says here in my translation, while they were worshiping the Lord, it, the actual original Greek is while they were giving their service to the Lord. You see, guys, they were busy doing what God had equipped them to do in the church. The Spirit of God spoke to them in that. It wasn't some like mystical, magical experience. They heard the voice of God through all of that. It was just they were simply doing what they had been called to do. Worship. Serve. They simply had their eyes and their hearts and their affections set on the Lord. Again, that's why it's so important that not just when we come here on a Sunday morning, but that in every moment of your lives, you are living with this attitude of worship, keeping your eyes focused on God, because those are the moments that God says, this is what I want you to hear. This is what I want you to know. This is what I want you to do. I believe that what Luke is doing here in Acts 13 is telling us that God revealed his will for Barnabas and Saul while they and the other three were fully engaged in ministry. And we're just five guys sitting around just waiting and wondering, like, well, what's the next thing here? God, No, they were just doing what God had called them to do, to be faithful, to be worshiping, to be serving God. There are too many people that seem to think that they should just sit on the sidelines of life and just wait for God to tell them what to do. I'm just, just waiting, God. You tell me. Guys, God has told us most of what we are supposed to do in his word. It's not a mystery. It's there for us. It's in black and white. When special guidance is required, he will supply that as well. But this usually comes when we are busy doing what God has called us to do. And it may be the case in life that some people are working when they should just be waiting and listening to God, but many more seem to just be waiting when they should be working and serving and worshiping God. It's been said this way, this is often the way that God works. 
here in Acts 13 and all throughout salvation history, he spoke to men, he spoke to women who were already at work doing what they knew. I love this line. You can steer a ship or a car if it's moving, but it's very difficult to steer it when it's sitting still. Have you ever tried to do that in your driveway or in your garage? You don't start the car up, you don't put it in gear, and you're sitting there trying to grab that wheel. How incredibly hard is that? <gasps> do you know, I think that sometimes, I know this at least with my life, I feel like that's what God sometimes feels like. I feel like I'm just trying to drive a car that's stuck and park and not going anywhere. And he has to just <clears throat> wrench things to get it to happen. Difficult to steer it when it's sitting still. God loves to see people at work and what they know to do, and then he will give them further direction. And speaking of further direction, it says here in Acts chapter 13, as these men were worshiping, and I believe we are to assume the entire church is doing the very same thing and involved in this, that's when the Holy Spirit said. And by the way, the Spirit didn't say and doesn't say as much as we would expect the Spirit to say, or more, more importantly, the way it often works in our life, the Spirit hardly ever speaks as much as we want the Spirit to say, right? Right? What does he say very simply here in Acts chapter 13? As they were worshiping, the Holy Spirit said, dedicate, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. That's all, folks. You're like, well, those aren't really great orders. I mean, like, that's pretty open-ended. That's pretty just, like, what do we do with that, God? The Spirit didn't specify where Barnabas and Saul were to go. Didn't, he didn't indicate precisely what their ministry would be, although if we look back in the book of Acts, we've already talked about that God, through Ananias, told Saul, this is what you're going to do. Barnabas knew what he was called to do. It was just now the, the time to do it. It was simply the work to which I have called them. The church releases Barnabas and Saul, but it was the Spirit who sends them out and guides them. We see that there in Acts chapter 13, verse 4. Guys, it sounds so insanely simple, doesn't it? The Spirit spoke, the Spirit sent, the church released, and the men, guess what? Went. That's it. That's the whole story of the first five verses here of what sets off everything in the book of Acts and all of New Testament history and all of salvation history to this point. What results from this sending out would forever change the face of the church and the world. The events of chapter 13 may not seem spectacular, but the results, guys, are significant. The gospel now goes deliberately and purposefully to the Gentiles in the entire world. Many Gentiles will come to faith Numerous churches are planted. The gospel goes from Antioch all the way to Rome and beyond and all across this world because some guys just decided we're going to be faithful in what God called us to do. We're going to hear what the Spirit says. The church releases us, and we are just going to go and do the work. Beyond this, and don't miss this, by the way, by Saul, who becomes Paul, a man who once traveled to various foreign countries to oppose the gospel to destroy the church, is now going from country to country, will go from country to country, preaching the very same gospel that he once opposed. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Can I make this really, really simple this morning? As I see it, not just here in Acts 13, but in the Bible as a whole, there are really only three sent into the world to be salt and light, but there is a special work that God has for some to go to the ends of the earth. And in that regard, these are the three options. Sending, going, sitting on your duff. 
So what in the world does Acts 13 really mean for you and for me? What might God want to say to you today if you would only, and if I would only, and if we collectively would only open our ears and hear our hearts and be drawn to what God is doing and has been doing in this world? Here is what I noticed, just four things that I want to pull out of this text this morning and walk right through it here. The first is this, God wants to use those who are faithful and available. If that sounds familiar to you, it's because just two weeks ago I, pre I preached that about Paul and Timothy. How in the world do we know who to pour into in our lives? It's this right here. God wants to use people, not that are smart or beautiful or have it all figured out. He just simply wants you to be faithful. He wants you to be available, to be wholly surrendered, as that song said today. Again, five guys here in this church in Antioch, and they're just doing what they're supposed to do. If you go back to Acts chapter 11, it just says several different times through there, there were some believers, those believers, they. There aren't even names given to these people. They're just people who are there doing the work of God. It all started. It all continues because of some believers. Again, they don't even get names. Everything on the ends of the earth front starts with, I love the line of the Casting Crown song. All these people were, were just somebodies who wanted to tell everybody all about somebody who saved. Go back to Acts chapter 11. The big guns to get into the picture. Before that, it's just the guys and the boots on the ground just doing stuff. What does it mean to follow Jesus and to be sent? It, guys, it's doing whatever God made you good at. Doing it well for the glory of God. Doing it somewhere strategic for the mission of God in the arena of sending people or actually going yourselves. Here's the really scary thing this morning. I really believe this. There's at least someone sitting in this room this morning that God has been tugging on your heart and telling you, you need to go. Not just simply go here in this community. That's very important. It is a starting point. But I believe there's at least one person that God's saying, go to the ends of the earth. And you're freaking out in your mind as God has been telling you that because you don't know what that means for your life. I can't tell you everything it means for your life, but I would say this. Good for you if that's what you're hearing God tell you to do because that's what you need to be doing. God wants to use those who are faithful and available. The second thing I notice here in Acts chapter 13 is that the Spirit, this is so important, we talk about this so often, the Spirit is the one who motivates and empowers sending and going. We can want to go all that we want to in our lives, but if the Spirit isn't sending us, it's not going to happen. Guys, what gives someone the supernatural confidence in an out-of-this-world call to go to the ends of the earth, possibly? It's the voice in the direction of the Holy Spirit. That's it. Guys, it's one thing to have the Spirit, which all believers do have the Spirit, but it's wholly another to acknowledge and know that the Spirit is speaking and guiding and empowering our every move. Again, so the men sent them on their way, and the Spirit led them. Guys, this will always be God's plan. God's plan to reach people is to be filled with the Spirit and walking in obedience. Do you know in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 59 times in the book of Acts. And of those 59 times, 36 of those he is speaking. He is saying something. He wants something to happen. What might he be saying to you today if you would just simply listen? God wants faithful and available people. The Spirit is the one who is sending and leading and guiding. And this next one is so very important, guys. It's just not even Acts 13. This is just good, simple, biblical common sense. As Jesus has done, 
so we will do in everything. Guys, Saul had his life radically changed and his priority shifted on that road to Damascus. Again, the man who sought to kill and stop the church is now the change agent for the growth of the church and the spread of the gospel to the outermost reaches of the world. Why does that happen? Because very simply, Christ sought Paul on that road. Really, he sought Paul for all of Saul's life. And he finally found him, and he changed him, and he called him, and now he commissioned him to do what had been done in him for him and to work through him. And this is so true throughout all of Scripture. As Paul chooses to spend his life and to end his life in the service of God because that's exactly what he found Jesus doing for him. Jesus, guys, spent himself for the good news of the gospel and for the glory of God. In Paul's first and in Paul's final moments, he is attempting to do for others what Jesus had done to him personally. I want, you, I want to ask you a real, real big question this morning. I'll ask it in two ways. Where would you be in your life without Jesus? Second way of asking that, because I don't want to assume in this room this morning that we're all just saved. Where are you in your life right now if you don't have Jesus? It's a heavy question, isn't it? Because the answer to it is that we would be in the same place that millions and billions of people are without Jesus. Guys, hearing the message of the gospel is an essential part of the salvation process, but people cannot hear the gospel if they are not sent. Romans 10, 15, that's what it says there, very, very specifically. It's been said, guys, the gospel is only good news for someone if it gets to them in time. If Jesus gave himself to save us, it makes sense that we ought to give ourselves to bring salvation to people who do not know Jesus by sending or by going ourselves. And the last thing that I want to say as I look through this and I have thought about this concept of sending and going this week and what it means to be a sending church is that we need to know, guys, it's all worth it. Specifically, Jesus is worth it. Uh, guys, I, I love the simplicity of this phrase here in verse 4. It says, so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And then what's it say? There are two words. What? They went. They didn't sit around and wonder about what was going to happen, or I'm waiting for a special call, God. They didn't sit on it and ponder it. They went. And we might wonder in our lives, did Paul ever, everything that Paul went through in his journeys and facing death and being close to death, he, for heaven's sake, folks, he was stoned at one place that he went, outside of the city walls, stoned almost to death. Then he got up, brushed himself off, and went right back into the city. That's hardcore. Do you think that he ever thought, this is worth it to me? 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 6, he says this, if you wonder if it was ever worth it to Paul, as for me, he says, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Do you think it was worth it to Paul? Absolutely. He said it in every way. It sounds to me that for Paul it was worth it. And this, guys, is what it boils down to in life. It doesn't matter how much want to you have in life, or shoulda, coulda, it boils down to this. Each and every single one of us have to make this call in our lives when it comes to the gospel. Is 
it worth it? Is it worth it to take that and to take it to people all around us? And as I scan through Scripture and history up to the present moment, it seems to me that scores of people all throughout salvation history have thought that Jesus and the gospel are worth it. Does that mean that it is easy? No, seldom is easy. Does it mean that it might be costly and messy? Absolutely it will be. But guys, the pain leads to the payoff. People in eternity forever. I would be so bold as to say, as someone else has remarked, the only thing that will give you the power to live a life of truly being sent in this world is the conviction that Jesus is worth it all. Would you just say that this morning? Like if you like, really believe that Jesus is worth it all. But guys, I hope that you live into that. Not just words, it's not just a phrase. Guys, Jesus is worthy of it all. He's the only one who is worthy, for by his will all things were created. By his blood all things are redeemed. For his glory we exist. Jesus is worthy, amen? Absolutely he is. What's very interesting as we wrap up here this morning is that we understand as we look at God and we look at the heart of God that God is a missionary God has been from the very beginning. You remember Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, right? God is speaking to Abram, and he says to Abram, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and treat with contempt. And then what's this phrase here? All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Jesus says it to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. That's a missionary spirit and the missionary heart of God. Guys, living a life of following Christ and soaking up his teaching and life without ever living it out is, it's no good. It's like a sponge that soaks up all this water but never gets squeezed out. It leads to oversaturation, being waterlogged, Likewise, we become spiritually obese and flabby. As one pastor says it, when we just sit there and take and take and take and take and never give anything out, we, ne- we just love to be saved, but we're never sent, is that we become overweight, sassy Christians. You know what I mean by this, right? Do you know any overweight, sassy Christians? You're like, really? Do you, do you have anything good to say? Do you have anything to be happy about in your life? That's what happens when we just... Guys, we are saved to be sent. We are not saved to just sit, but to be sent. From chapter 13 of Acts onward is a result of what happens when people in their sentness go. The church, the ecclesia, the gathered people, the assembled people of God are the called out ones and they are sent out into this world. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. I've read Acts chapter 8, verse 1. I can't tell you how many times. I'm so familiar with it. But it hit me in a new way this week. It it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers, except the apostles, by the way, notice that again, except the apostles, they stayed back in Jerusalem, Everybody else was scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. You hear what's happening there, right? It's a carbon copy of Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses and you will go to Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria. There it is in Acts chapter 1 and what's happening. I had a conversation with someone this week and I just really was thinking about the church. I was thinking about this church and I'm like, God, what, what do you have next for this church? And and as I read Acts chapter 8, verse 1, I was like, oh, perhaps what has happened in the church as a whole and perhaps what happens sometimes even in a local church like New Heights is that we just get stuck in what I would call a Jerusalem moment. We're just kind of huddled here in Jerusalem, everything's good. And then things start to happen and pain starts to happen, and God says, I, I, okay, this is how I'm going to get you. That's the only way that God got his church out of Jerusalem was a persecution, was real bad pain and struggle and suffering, and they were flung out to the ends of the earth. 
And perhaps what God might be doing in his church is letting the church experience a little bit of pain and suffering and agony. And he says, if this is the only way that I can get you to understand to get out of Jerusalem, then this is what I'm going to do. If this is the only way that I can get you to understand that you are to be sent, this is what I'm going to do. Guys, we might not often think of it this way, but Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Acts chapter 1, 8, is a continuation of the call that God has had us for his people from the very beginning of time. We are just stepping into something that God started thousands of years ago. I was reading this story uh, this week about the famous missionary uh, William Carey. He's one of the first guys to step out and to go to the ends of the earth. And as I was reading this story, what was very fascinating, and this is very important, by the way, is that William Carey didn't just go, you know what, I'm heading out, going to the ends of the earth. He had a group of guys that he had that stood behind him and supported him in every single thing that he did. And by the way, when he went to where he was going to go, he did not see a single convert for like five, six, seven years. Nothing. No fruit whatsoever. You imagine how discouraging that is to do that? And he said, the only reason that I was able to keep on going was because of the church, if you will, the group of guys that I left back home. And he had this very significant phrase that he used, and all of the guys kind of committed to this. William Carey says, guess what? This looks like a big dark hole that I'm jumping into, but I'll do it if you guys would just simply hold the rope. And William Carey would attest to that and look back on that, all of those years that he spent on the foreign mission field, and he would say, the only reason that I was ever, ever able to make it in doing what God had called me to do through some very desperate and difficult times was that I had a whole bunch of guys back home who were holding the rope. You guys understand, as the church, that is our job. Most of us, and what will really happen for many of us, is that we should dig ourselves into being people who send. Send, send, send. Pray. Again, we're going to talk in our family meeting later on about people who aren't necessarily from New Heights, but people we've partnered with, and they're all over this globe doing the work of God. What would it mean for those people and in those people's ministry that we did what William Carey and his group of guys talked about? We would just hold the rope. We would pray our little tails off for them. We would support when we can and where we can. But again, for some of us, one or two of us, God is calling us, go, get out of here, go to the end of the earth and do what I've called you to do. Vast amount of peoples who, again, this is so hard to imagine and believe, but it's becoming easier to believe because even in America, we have a whole slew of people that don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ but billions across the world who not only have never heard the gospel of Christ, but they don't even know a person who is a Jesus follower. That's desperate. So I think the best thing that we could do this morning is just simply as we close this out here, pray. We'll spend some time during our family meeting as well, praying for our specific missionaries and our ministry partners. But we pray this morning that God would get to our hearts And in whatever he's calling us to do, that we would do that very thing. Would you pray?